In September of 2014, I began my hobby of making YouTube videos, and recently I hit a major milestone. 1,000 subscribers! I want to thank everyone who's watched my content and helped me reach this point, and now I have a promise to uphold. I built this channel on the premise of talking about video games, and today I'm talking about the 15 games I hold above all others. There are a lot of reasons I could love a game this much. It could be for some specific memory or story, something unique the game did that made it stand out, or that the game is just really, really fun. These 15 games are the ones I hold in the high echelons. Standard rules apply, meaning only one game per franchise. Now it's finally time to talk about my favorite games. Let's roll! Indie games are quite the unique bunch. When I need a break from the big games companies heavily promote, I decide to look at games made by smaller teams that can be just as good. One of my favorite games from 2016 was Guacamelee, a super fun Metroidvania, and when I heard a sequel was coming out, I was excited. And boy howdy, it turned out even better than I expected! The core aspects of the first game are all present here. You got a large interconnected world, fun combat, secrets abound, and Mexican culture everywhere you look. However, it's all the little changes that really elevate this game. For one thing, the chicken farm was given so much versatility in this game. In the previous game, it was really only used to get through narrow passages, but here it has a full moveset for both movement and combat. And let me tell you, being able to suplex a skeleton as a chicken is one of the greatest things I've ever done in a video game. Second, the upgrade system was handled remarkably well. At any time, you can pull up the upgrade menu and spend your money to have certain attacks hit harder, gain more money, or other attributes like regaining stamina quicker. And with how it's set up, you can upgrade one however you want, and I love that. Finally, there's the game's biggest selling point to me. It's humor. The first game was really funny too, don't get me wrong, but they really took it up a notch here. From the new villains, to the multitude of new faces, and even a few hidden areas being so uniquely charming, this game has me smiling the whole way through. If you played and enjoyed the first game, you'll absolutely love this game. Es muy excelente! I've mentioned it a lot in this channel, but Platinum Games is one of my absolute favorite game developers. They always make games that manage to be over the top, exciting, and super memorable. And those adjectives flawlessly describe Bayonetta 2. Here we have another sequel that builds on what the first game did well. Bayonetta was already really fun and exciting, and here they trimmed the fat and removed elements that didn't work, making for an all-around better package. The combat is still as smooth and wicked as before, the writing is absolutely top-notch, the bosses are climactic as all get out, and have I mentioned how magnificent the soundtrack is? And it took out things like penalizing use of healing items and those bothersome quick time events, which I 100% approve. There isn't really a whole lot more I can say about this game that I haven't said multiple times. It's fun, frantic, and excellent. That's all I can really ask for. I certainly enjoy games with complex mechanics and thrilling narratives, but sometimes I just enjoy playing something simple. A game that just provides a good time with no frills or gimmicks attached, and Rayman Legends is without a doubt the king of that. This game is about as basic as you can get, as you just get from point A to point B in every level. But it's that very simplicity that keeps me coming back time and again. The levels can get super creative and take great advantage of Rayman's moveset for interesting challenges, plus trying to collect as many lumps as possible and going after all the hidden teensies just adds to the enjoyment. And you know what else adds to my enjoyment? The co-op action! At any time, up to three people can join in your adventure and provide you with help and also some laughs. And when you throw Murphy's ability to directly affect the level environment into the mix, the co-op becomes insanely fun. Seriously, just seeing all the slapstick in the game makes the occasional accidental death worth it. Add in a fantastic soundtrack, memorable set pieces, and really fun bosses, and this is without a doubt my favorite 2D platformer. And if you still aren't convinced that this game is worth your time, there's a level that plays Eye of the Tiger with kazoos! I feel like it justified getting the game with that alone. Licensed games are a fickle bunch. Some are alright, some are actually pretty good, but most you want to avoid with a 50 foot pull. However, rarely does a licensed game truly stand out as excellent, but when it does, it could be something like Spider-Man. I picked this game up after hearing so many amazing things about it, and it absolutely blew my mind across the state. This game climbed my favorite games list in record time, it's just so good! Swinging around the vast and incredibly accurate city of New York just feels so amazing, and I've spent so much time just swinging around seeing what may lie around the corner. And the best part is, there's always something to find to reward me for my curiosity. Whether it be a backpack that holds an item from Spider-Man's past, a landmark to take a picture of, a crime to stop, or one of the many other collectibles that become available as the game goes on, there's always something to look forward to. 
Adding to the whole package is just how well Peter Parker is characterized. He was already well known for his quips and attitude, and they took that to 11 here. Seriously, Yuri Lewenthal was clearly having too much fun recording these lines, but the best part of the whole package is just how smooth the game is. Everything from web swinging to combat to side missions to puzzles just has the perfect sense of flow. This is the kind of game to go down in history as one of the best licensed games of all time, and it's absolutely one of my favorite games ever. Mario! That man can really be in any kind of game. He could be in a platformer, a racing game, multiple sports games, a painting game. He can even be in a... turn-based strategy game? With the Rabbids? Uh, sure. I'll bite, I guess. Where has this game been all my life? When I first heard about this game, I didn't expect much out of it. I just thought it'd be a quirky game and not much more. However, I was proven so very wrong because this game is awesome. The premise is certainly out there, but the story hardly takes itself seriously, so it ends up working out really well. And the writing in this game is some of the best I've ever seen. There are just so many memorable and hilarious moments sprinkled throughout the game that I struggle to pin down a favorite. But if that were it, then this game wouldn't be on this list. The game itself is super well made beyond the story and writing. Every mission requires you to think about who to bring and how to best use the character's various attributes, like how Mario can stop enemies, Rabbit Peach can heal, and the YouTuber can debuff enemies. And as you get other characters throughout the game, your repertoire of skills increases, allowing you to get more creative with handling challenges. And there's way more content than just the main story, such as the assortment of challenges that appear after beating a world and a super fun multiplayer mode. Seriously, get the right person to play this with and you'll have hours of fun. Man, I wish I had online play! That one to pick aside, this game certainly took me by surprise and became my favorite Mario game, and you should absolutely check it out. Oh man, ever since seeing that cutscene of Link overlooking Hyrule, I knew that this game would be something special. Breath of the Wild is truly a special game, and it felt like it took forever to finally get here. But you know what? After all that waiting, it was totally worth it. Fundamentally, this game is completely different from almost every game in the series. Instead of being given a set path to follow that builds up to the finale, you're simply told your objective and go! This game really is about how you make your adventure, and there are so many ways you can go about it after leaving the Great Plateau. You can explore the land to find secrets, tackle one of the many shrines scattered throughout Hyrule, find some little Koroks along the way, or heck, you can just go straight to the final boss if you feel confident enough. This kind of structure, there's so many ways I personally play this game that it's a little different each time I pick it up. One day I could hunt for a new shrine to find, and another I could just climb a tall mountain and chill out at the top. I can fight powerful enemies for rare weapons, so just talk with the townsfolk. There are so many ways to play that everyone will have a vastly different experience. But no matter what, I think we can all agree that this game is truly amazing. I've played so many indie games over the years, and they've all provided something unique to set them apart. Whether it be a good story, a fun world, memorable characters, or maybe the game itself just does something super creative. However, even with all the indies I've played, I still hold Dust and Elysian Tale as my favorite. This game absolutely blew me away when I played it back in 2015, and over four years later, it's still incredible. On the surface, it does seem like a fairly typical Metroidvania, and sure, for the most part it is. But it's what it does within those parameters that makes it truly special. For one thing, Dust is simply a joy to control. Every action he takes just feels so good to execute, whether it be exploration or combat. And speaking of the combat, it may be simple, but there's so much you can do with it. I try to get as creative as I possibly can with offing enemies, and leads to moments of absolute joy as well as just a feast for the eyes. Speaking of which, the presentation for this game is phenomenal, with a beautiful art style, magnificent soundtrack, and stellar voice acting. However, the biggest reason this game is still my favorite indie is because of how well its story is handled. This story took some insane risks, but it paid off because it's still beautiful. Seeing Dust work his way to defeat Gaius is such a thrilling and emotional tale and I never get sick of it. If a new indie game comes out and tries to contest my top spot, they certainly have the work cut out for them. There are a lot of ways that can become interested in playing a game. It could be through some clever marketing, a recommendation from a friend, or just simple word of mouth. But then there's playing a game based on its reputation alone. Knowing that a game I'm getting will be good, but not knowing why. And that sentiment describes Xenoblade Chronicles perfectly. Around 2013 to 2014, it was nearly impossible to not hear non-stop praise for this game, and it was still the best 70 bucks I ever spent. I knew nothing about this game going in, and I'm so glad I went in blind, because this game absolutely blew my mind into the next state. The worlds of Bionis and Mechonis are full of super interesting sights, flora, and fauna, and that's before you get to the memorable characters. 
Every notable character stands out in one way, for better or worse. All the party members are super likable, from the lovable goof Ryan, the heroic Dunban, to the adorable Riki, but then there's Shulk, and he absolutely takes the cake. His actions throughout the story makes him one of the absolute best protagonists I've ever seen. He originally just wanted revenge, but he eventually simply wanted to help all the different races he came across in any way he could. And that's just a story and characters, this game has so much more to offer! The combat is just incredibly fun, allowing you to choose the party of any three allies you want, leading to so many possibilities. While not all their playstyles are my cup of tea, it's still so much fun to experiment with different combinations for each situation. But then there's this game's soundtrack, and HOLY MACKEREL it's another masterpiece! The area themes convey a sense of calmness, the battle themes get you fired up, and the cutscene themes can make you feel angry, sad, and so much more. There's so many emotions crammed into it, and I love just about every song here. If you haven't played this game yet, then you're denying yourself one of the absolute best RPGs of the last decade. Get on it now! The Tales series is one of my absolute favorite RPG series. These games provide thrilling stories, memorable characters, amazing worlds and lore, and super fun combat. I started with Tales of the Abyss back in 2014, and even with all the amazing games I played afterwards like Symphonia, Zillia, and especially Vesperia, I still hold Abyss as my favorite. Like I mentioned, this game has a ton going for it. Let's start with that story. It doesn't start out with much, just Luke trying to return home after a freak accident, but in typical Tales fashion, a lot more happens along the way to evolve the plot. A simple return trip slowly but surely turns into a battle to decide the fate of the world and the main protagonist. And speaking of that protagonist, Luke von Frabra is a rather special case. At the start, he's just incredibly irritating, and he's basically every stereotype of an adolescent aristocrat. He's whiny, demanding, takes no responsibility, and expects everything handed to him on a silver platter. And yet, he's one of my favorite video game characters because of how well he develops. Once he realizes all the trouble he's caused for others and himself, he vows to change in a really powerful moment. And throughout the rest of the game, he holds up that promise and becomes a truly wonderful protagonist. And that's just one character, there's so many more to love! There's the reserved tier, the charismatic guy, the refined Natalia, and the adorable Annis. But then there's Jade, a truly unique case. I don't know whose idea it was to make this guy so hilarious throughout, but they are a better person because of it. The story and characters are certainly amazing, and adding the amazing combat on top of that makes this game truly fantastic. Every Tales game has its own little combat quirk, and for Abyss, that's phone on fields. When elemental attacks are used, they leave behind these circles, and when enough of them are used and a colored one appears, you can transform arts into completely different arts. However, there's a trade-off to this mechanic. Enemies can do the same thing. As a result, combat in this game becomes a brilliant test in multitasking and planning, as you need to figure out the best phone on field to use while also not letting the opponent get advantage from them. And the bosses take great advantage of this idea, and a lot of them are really fun because of it. I don't know what the future of the Tales series holds, but they have a pretty high bar if Tales of the Abyss is anything to go by. If you've watched my channel for any reasonable length of time, then chances are you've heard me gush about Platinum games. In fact, I did so earlier in this list. Out of all the third-party game developers, Platinum has got to be one of, if not my absolute favorite. Their games always deliver a high adrenaline rush that I just never tire of. But their finest in my eyes is just a bit more wonderful. The Wonderful 101 was the first game from Platinum I ever played, and man did it set a great first impression. What I just said about all of Platinum Games' products absolutely applies here. The entire game is just so energetic and never once gets boring. The gameplay can be best described as Pikmin meets a beat-em-up. Using a group of up to 100 wonderful ones, you can utterly destroy any enemy that crosses your path with a multitude of Unite Morphs. You can punch them in the face with Unite Hand, slice and dice with Unite Sword, blast them with Unite Gun, whip them with Unite... Whip, slam them with Unite Hammer, freeze them with Unite Claw, and slow them down for an assault with Unite Bomb. Each of the seven Unite Morphs is useful no matter the situation, and they make dealing with enemies both big and small so much fun! This is especially true during the quick time events, where the slowed down action really makes the whole thing look cool. And don't worry about failing them, most of the time it's a little more than a bit of damage, and you can see a rather humorous cutscene. Seriously, go look up the QTE fails for this game and you'll be laughing the whole time. Actually, you don't have to, let me show you some of my favorites! And this game is tied together by a surprisingly gripping story. Throughout it, you'll laugh, you'll cry, and you'll be utterly amazed by these really well done characters. The Wonderful Wall 1 gets just about everything right, and whenever I go back to it, I'm amazed all over again. It's pretty apparent, but I absolutely adore the RPG genre. I love just getting sucked into a fantasy world and being immersed in a thrilling story with memorable characters. 
and when it comes to this genre, there's a very special game I'd like to bring up, a hidden gem called The Last Story. This game is one of the most beautiful games I've ever played in so many ways. The world of this game is easily one of the most intriguing and fascinating fantasy worlds I've ever seen, filled with all sorts of thought-provoking locations and objects that I'm still thinking about to this day. And the story takes great advantage of these ideas. It's centered around a group of mercenaries in Lazarus City, who've all been dealt a tough hand and long for a better life. They do whatever they can to help others, whether it be slaying monsters, recovering lost items in dungeons, or even saving lives. Even though they have to deal with the stigma of being mercenaries, their resolve never wavers. But one mercenary among them is special. The main protagonist, Zael. He dreams to become a knight because he wants to protect those close to him. Similar to Tales of the Abyss, what starts off as a simple premise turns into an incredibly deep and fleshed out story. There are plenty of curveballs thrown throughout that really make you question the morality of the entire situation and what the characters truly want. Zale and the others develop beautifully, especially when they're enlisted into the castle to fight the Garak. I'd love to go into more detail, but I really don't want to spoil the story for those who haven't experienced it yet. The gameplay is quite enjoyable, too. The hub world of Lazarus City is incredibly fun to just walk around in. Seriously, there have been plenty of moments where I've just taken time to walk around the city and see the sights. And exploring not only lets you see a beautiful city, but there are also plenty of side quests and hidden chapters to do that just add more to the story and these amazing characters. And when you're actually fighting enemies, it is so much fun! All of your allies have their own preferred methods of dealing damage, and everyone working together in tandem makes battles so thrilling! Especially when you use the environment to your advantage and give your allies commands to massively change the tide of battle. It's truly a shame that more people haven't played this game, because it's easily one of the best RPGs I've ever seen. Oh come on, you thought I wouldn't include this one? I could gush about how much of a masterpiece Super Smash Bros. Ultimate is, but I feel like that's been done to death at this point, so I'll try to explain why I love this game in a more sensible manner. And with that out of the way, this game is so much fun! Super Smash Bros. has always been ridiculously fun to play, and this game is absolutely no different. Every character is unique in how they handle, and with so many to choose from, there's bound to be that one that you'll decide is your favorite. For me, it's Lucario. Again. And the options don't stop there. There are loads of ways you can fight. You can do what I do and go for the high adrenaline chaotic method with a bunch of items and stage hazards, but you can also turn off items and play on a battlefield or omega version of your favorite stage to make things a bit more personal if you please. And speaking of those stages, most of them are a total blast. While some of them really aren't that fun, a vast majority of them are just great. And with the new stage more feature, you can have the stage change in the middle of combat, which is such a cool idea. And that's just the multiplayer, there's a bunch of stuff you can do alone. The classic mode has been revamped, and definitely for the better. Every character has their own unique take on it that matches them in some way. I love how this was handled, as it keeps the mode fresh, and there's so much attention to detail that I love. But then there's the big one, World of Light. I know this is something a lot of people didn't care for, but for me personally, I love this. Every fighter has been captured except for Kirby, because of course he's the survivor, and it's up to you to free everyone. The battles you fight here take the form of these spirits, and they're set up not unlike event missions from previous games. The spirit you're fighting determines the conditions in play, such as strong winds, low gravity, or even the occasional reinforcements. While a few of these really aren't fun, most of them are fantastic and truly pay respect to the series. And the best part is you can fight these spirits on the spirit board for even more challenges, especially with new spirits being added all the time. Add in a truly massive soundtrack, a stellar online mode for the most part, and the addition of new DLC characters like Terry, Joker, and even a Piranha Plant, and this is a Smash Bros. dream game. I can't wait to see what the future holds, but for now, I'll see you on the battlefield! There aren't a lot of games I'll sink a ridiculous amount of time into. I like to give all the games I own their own amount of time to be enjoyed. However, there are definitely exceptions to this. And when you see just how much time I've spent playing Overwatch, you can probably tell that's one of them. Seriously, I never expected that over three years later, I would still be playing and loving Overwatch this much. This game is a shining example of doing something unique with an established formula. I've never been a big fan of the first-person shooter genre as a whole, but Overwatch barely feels like one. Sure, you have the first-person perspective and you shoot things, but there's so much more than that. The 31 heroes and counting in the game all bring something completely unique to the table, with completely different weapons, abilities, and capabilities. The way that they're set up, all of them have their uses over others, and there are always to be times where certain heroes should be used. Something like Orisa's defensive capabilities, Moira's healing versatility, or Zarya's ability to go offensive while also playing defense. These situations and more are the reason the game is constantly kept fresh and interesting, as a single change in heroes can drastically change the flow of the game. And that's just the basic game, the arcade mode adds new layers to the fun available. There's stuff like capture the flag for a new objective, no limits to let loose those truly dumb strategies that can work, total mayhem which is a completely accurate description, and a bunch of event game modes added during the many events held throughout the year. But then there's the matter of the custom games. This is probably one of the best ideas that devs ever had for this game, as these games can range from creative to downright insane and I love it. I'll probably be playing this game for years to come, and I'm greatly looking forward to what will be added in the future.
When it comes to RPGs, they all have something unique to set them apart, whether it be for their unique stories, memorable characters, fun combat, or interesting world. But not too many games in this genre can stand out because of their style. I guess I can't really say, you never saw it coming. If you've been keeping up with my channel, you'll know I've been doing a let's play of a special game called Persona 5, and there's a good reason for that. When I first played this game, it absolutely blew me away in every single respect. The story was super engaging with all kinds of twists and turns, knowing when to be suspenseful, knowing when to get exciting, and knowing when to calm down. Not to mention, exploring the premise of cognition led to so many supremely memorable moments. Adding to this is the cast of characters themselves. All of your party members either felt cast from society, deluded themselves into believing their false cognitions were true, or, in the case of Best Girl Furtaba, BOTH! This makes the cast really relatable, as I'm sure we've all been there at one point. And the fact that they're fighting to change how society is as a whole is just amazing. However, an interesting story and amazing characters would involve the game into second place on its own. Let's talk about that gameplay. Like any Persona game, it's split into two halves, Life Sim and Dungeon Crawling. When in the Life Sim, you just go about your day as an ordinary high school student. You can go to school to chat with your friends and do all sorts of other activities. Not only are these parts really relaxing, but getting to learn more about not just your party members, but other people also struggling with similar issues just adds so much to the experience. But then when the sun sets and the mask goes on, that's when this game goes from fantastic to utterly amazing. Unlike other Persona games, dungeons aren't simply a bunch of mazes with a sort of coherent theme. Dungeons in this game each have their own unique layout and set pieces, and they all stand out from one another. There's plenty of treasures to find, puzzles to solve, and enemies to fight. Speaking of which, I absolutely adore this game's combat. Sure, it's not much different from a typical turn-based RPG, but what makes it work is just how smooth it is. Hitting the buttons to do different actions just feels so much better than navigating menus, and really adds to the experience. But then there's the game's biggest selling point in my opinion. It's style. Everything from the color palette, to the animations, to the freaking transition screens gives off so much pizzazz that it just makes me love the game even more. Persona 5 fully encapsulates why I love the RPG genre, and yet, it could only reach second. It's time to find out which game holds my top spot. As you probably surmise, my number one favorite game is a Pokemon game. So much of my identity is based on this series. However, the question then becomes which game it is. Well, it would have to be the game that best symbolizes why I love the series. And if you recall back in my favorite games of 2016, I said that Pokemon Moon had become my new favorite game. However, Pokemon Ultra Moon came out a year later and tried to usurp that title. Did it succeed? Well, let's look at the two games back to back. Oh man, 2016 was such a great year for Pokemon fans. Everyone was celebrating the series' 20th anniversary, and it was so much fun seeing everyone come together. However, the biggest part of that celebration came on November 18th, the release of Pokemon Sun and Moon. Throughout the year, we were relentlessly teased with reveals of Pokemon, characters, and locations, and we were all mega hyped. And then the day finally came, and the hype paid off immensely. Throughout my first playthrough, I had some of the most fun I have ever had playing a Pokemon game. All the new Pokemon, all the new regional variants, the areas, the story, the characters, everything just worked together to the best possible result I could have hoped for. However, a challenger then approached. A year later, we retreated to Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, and they sought to add more! More Pokemon! More characters! More challenges! More post-game! Yes, it certainly felt like an overall bigger package, and I loved so many of the new additions. Mantine surfing is a fun pastime, the new threat of Necrozma was chilling and exhilarating, the new move tutors made Pokemon so much more versatile, and the Team Rainbow Rocket postgame is one of the best postgames in the series in my opinion. On its own, it certainly felt grander, however, it didn't have the hype factor of the original games, and the story felt overall weaker in many places. But was that enough to keep it down? Alright, you guys have waited long enough. My pick for my number one favorite game is... Pokemon Moon! Even with all the things added and tweaked in Ultra Moon, the sheer hype and excitement for Moon has left an impact that I cannot ignore. All that and more is why I hold this game at the top. I'm Arrow Dragon, and thanks for all of your support. Once again, I want to thank all of my viewers and supporters for helping me reach this point, and I hope you'll continue to support me in the future. I don't know what my next big project will be, so I want you guys to throw your suggestions at me. Suggest countdown topics or games to review, and I might just do it. Until next time, this is Arrow Dragon, signing out.